In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. One more time and open the palms of your hands in receptivity. Holy Spirit, come, come, Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, come, hallelujah. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, Spirit, come. Come, Holy Ghost, and fill the hearts of your people. Renew the face of the earth. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill our hearts as we gather together to learn about this inheritance that we have received, the gift of eternal life in our brother Jesus Christ, and teach us how to share that inheritance with others. Come, Holy Spirit, through Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Father, one God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good afternoon. afternoon. How are you all doing? How many of you are sleepy? Raise your hands. There we go. Okay. Okay, just so you know, I've got some cold water here. And all the assistants, all the guys and girls in black shirts, they are they have cold water as well to squirt you if you ever, if you doze off. Yes, very good. And I'm glad to see that you love your lives. Many of you came here not because you wanted to, but because I told you you would die if you didn't come. Good. It worked. Threats work. Um, so we don't have as much time. I think we've got 45 minutes. Does anyone know? What does it say on the thing? I've got an hour. All right, let's have some fun. Okay, good. So the title of this workshop is Sharing the Glorious Inheritance. Sharing the Glorious Inheritance. And of course, as you might imagine, it has to do something uh, with something with, to do with evangelizing, which is the sharing of the gospel. Sharing the Glorious Inheritance is sharing that which we have inherited, and as Bishop Sam Jacobs so beautifully and articulately put last night, the inheritance is the Son. And so sharing the inheritance is sharing the Son, is sharing Jesus Christ himself. And that is what we are here about. But before we get to the sharing part, there's something that's very important that is very key. And so the way I'm going to frame this is a dynamism, as I said last night, between communion and mission. I truly believe that the two sides of the church, the two pillars of the church are communion and mission. That without either of these, the church is done. At least the church is not fruitful. You see, the church can't disappear. Jesus promised that the church would always be there, the universal church. He did not make that promise, however, to every particular church, to every diocese. Which is why there are dioceses that have died off in history. There are dioceses that have died that, have, uh, that no longer exist. And so that can happen to us. And there are nations that were once Christian that no longer are Christian. I remember when John Paul II went to France and called France la fille aînée de la foi. The first daughter of the faith. Uh, but uh, he asked her the daughter, what have you done with your baptism, friends? A friends that was able to provide so many saints like Teresa of Lisieux, like so many, 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 many great saints and scholars for the church uh, today seems to be going down the drains. And so we must be careful not to think, to presume 
on the grace of Christ to think, well, Jesus said that not even the gates of hell can prevail against the church. Therefore, that means I can just sit back and relax and it'll just happen like everything else happens in my life. I can be passive. I guarantee you, if you don't do something, you will disappear. You will not be fruitful and perhaps your particular community will disappear. So this, is, this call upon you is one, it's not an option. It is rather a necessity. It's an obligation that is placed upon you. And St. Paul puts it well, as we're going to see later. But in order to get to mission, we need to get to communion. Communion will always lead to mission, and true mission will always lead to communion. And communion, I mean it in a specific way. But let's see some examples. Jesus Christ himself, before going out to do his public ministry, he spent 30 years in the family. In his little community, 30 years he spent there. Can you imagine all that must have entailed? We too are called to be nourished in the holy family, in the household of God. And what is the household of God? St. Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 3.15. I am writing that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation or the pillar and bulwark of the truth. This verse, of course, is a little trick verse. Scott Hahn used that one uh, with some of his former professors back at uh, seminary when he asked them, you know, according to the Bible, what is the pillar and foundation of the truth? And, of course, all of them said, well, the Bible, of course, is the pillar and foundation of truth. And Scott said, well, it seems that St. Paul thinks differently, that the church is the church is the pillar that holds up the Bible, that holds up tradition. And so the church is that body, is that institution, that living institution that is the family of God, and we must be nourished in her. And if we want the fullness of the truth, we must come to the church. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 23, tells us that Jesus, who is all in all, has his body, which is the church, and the church is the fullness of Christ. Very very telling uh, uh, verse. In fact, so much so that I'm going to turn to it because it's so important for us to understand that idea of communion. Uh, Ephesians is in the New Testament, again, for those of you Catholics. It's the last, if you remember, the first chapter of Ephesians and the last verse, okay? Um, <clears throat> And he has put, in verse 22, and he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So that false dichotomy that some people try to place between the church and Jesus is just that, false. It's a false dichotomy. You can't, you can't have the church without Jesus, and you can't have Jesus without the church. So you can't say, I'm just spiritual. I'm just Christian. I don't belong to any church. Well, that's stupid. <laughs> or it is. We just call it what it is. Because it is false. It is unbiblical. Jesus didn't just come to make people spiritual. Jesus came to make us a family. To make us one with him, his little brothers and sisters, in the family of his father, who has been at work from the beginning Building himself up a family. Let me give you the quick little summary of the process of his salvation history of God wanting to bring us together into his family. If you remember, God built, uh, built, created the first man and woman, Adam and Eve. And he wanted to have covenant with them, meaning he wanted to have a bond with them. A bond between two strangers that is made by an oath. It's a family bond and it's called covenant. And God swore to be the father of Abraham and Eve, he was their God, and they were his creatures. And so in that covenant that God had with them, they broke it, of course, but God wanted them to be his sons, his son and daughter, which is why Adam was made in the image of God. And that phrase, to be made in the image of, is used later on for one of the sons of Adam, and that's how we know that to be made in the image of has to do with sonship. 
That is why our dignity lies in our being created in the image and likeness of God. Our dignity is not in what we can do or say, which is why the dignity of the smallest human being, even at one second old in the womb, is still a full human dignity because it doesn't depend on the size, on what you do, on what you say, how much money you have, or whatever else. It depends only on the fact that every single human person is created in the image and likeness of God. So, Adam... God wanted him to be his son, his family. Of course, we broke that covenant, and God didn't just sit back and waited for Adam to come back, but rather God kept pursuing, and he offered a new covenant with a new mediator, this time growing the family a little bit more. And this time, instead of just a couple, but he had a household under Noah. And under Noah, God's covenant enlarged, enlarged, and it was growing. But even with Noah and his family, there was some fall off. People ran away from God, and God kept pursuing man. God kept trying to build his family bigger and bigger. And so he offered yet another covenant or a renewal of that covenant under Abraham, which at this time it was no longer a household, but it became a tribe. So under Abraham, the family of God grew to a tribe. But of course, after Abraham, man, who never learns, he ceases to follow God, and he falls off again. So God, who never ceases to pursue man, he sends yet an, an invitation to another covenant, this time with Moses. And with Moses as a mediator, and this covenant now is much bigger because it has to do with a nation. Moses is now leading a nation, the nation of God, the people of God. And how wonderful. At Mount Sinai, God revealed his laws to his children, and his laws, by the way, are the expression of the vulnerability of God. Why do I say that? Yes, the laws of God are an expression of his vulnerability, and therefore, his wanting to fall in love with us, for us to fall in love with him. Love is vulnerability. That is why Jesus opens himself up to all sorts of insults and curses, and opens himself up to death on the cross, and that is the greatest expression of love. So God, in telling us his laws, is telling us how we can hurt him. You see, man always sinned before the law, but man was culpable of the sin after the law. Because now he knows. If he didn't know, he's forgiven. When someone does something to you innocently, even though it hurts you, but it's so easy to forgive that person, isn't it? When a child does something to you, um, you just... Pass it off as, he just doesn't know. You know, a little baby poops on you. That's okay. <laughs> but if an adult pooped on you, that would be a different story. Because you know you're not supposed to poop on me. I don't know how that would happen, but it, I suppose it can. <laughs> so God revealed his laws in order to enter into that vulnerability with us. Because now that God tells us, if you break this, you break my heart. The breaking of the law, the breaking of a commandment is not just the breaking of stones. It is the breaking of God's heart. And he puts himself in harm's way like that. And that's love. It's an offer of love. And of course, we worship idols. We turn away from God. He didn't turn away though. He turned toward us and pursued us even more as the divine uh, hound. As, uh, what is it called? Hound of heaven. Thank you very much from that wonderful poem from the English guy. And so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> God then wanted to renew that covenant with us again and on, with a new mediator under David this time, the family grew bigger uh, as more sort of of an empire, of a kingdom, uh, so that there were other nations that were connected to this family. Uh, other people would come from different places to come and worship in the temple under David and his son, Solomon. How wonderful, how beautiful. And in that kingdom, there are many, many points that are important. Uh, but three of the secondary points are my favorite. The three of the secondary points are the presence of the Todah sacrifice, which is the sacrifice of thanksgiving, thanking God, and it is offered, it's bread and wine that is offered. Under the Davidic kingdom, that sacrifice trumps all the other ones. All the other animal sacrifices and everything else, they're still present, but the Todah sacrifice, T-O-D-A-H, which is the Hebrew word for thanksgiving, uh, the Greek word, by the way, for that same uh, concept is Eucharistion, which means 
to give thanks, thanksgiving. So that sacrifice was the primary sacrifice under the Davidic kingdom. Another thing was the, 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 the queen mother. Yeah, that's right. The Gabira. I see some people who are taking Scott Hans classes. Very good. The, the Gabira, who's the queen mother. And as you see in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 19, the queen mother is the mother of the king. And she is the queen in the kingdom. Why? Well, the kings usually were pretty bad boys. So Solomon, for example, had about 1,000 wives and, and concubines combined, 700 wives and 300 concubines. Um, those poor concubines, they must have been like, wait, you got 700 and you can't add one more? You have to keep me in the concubinage state? That's just messed up. But anyway, 700 and 300. <clears throat> so how do you choose one to become queen? Can you imagine the infighting that would never end in the kingdom? 1,000 women fighting each other for the seat of the queen. So to solve that problem, just make the mother the queen. And her presence, of course, is a sign of legitimacy for the kingdom because she is the wife of the former king. So she says, yeah, this is my son. He really is a rightful heir to the throne. And so the queen mother, we see, has a lot of power in the Davidic kingdom with Solomon. Um, she, well, she gets what she wants. Although with Solomon, there was one thing she didn't get because what she asked for uh, wasn't going to be good for the kingdom. The third thing, uh, of course, is the, the role of the vizier, which is the prime minister of the kingdom. The Davidic kingdom had 12 ministers, and there was one of them that was the lead minister, if you will. And it specifically says in Isaiah 22 that whatever this minister shut, in other words, decisions he took to tighten stuff, no one could open, and what he opened, no one could shut. And he would be called a father to the nation in Jerusalem. Hmm. Now, how is that fulfilled? <laughs> so, God, when we ran away under that covenant, he decided finally, all right, no more other mediators. I myself will come to lead my people and to tell them how much I love them. You know how some guys, they like to send notes to girls through their friends to tell them how they like them? So God ceased to send notes through friends. He came himself to tell the girl how much he loves her. And so God came. And that's why the story of Jesus at the well telling that woman how much, how much she meant. He was actually spiritually spitting game to that girl who had five husbands representing the five different deities of the five different nations that came into contact with Samaria. Jesus is saying, you fell into idolatry because idolatry, the worshiping of other gods, is an adulterous relationship with those other gods. And therefore, the true worship is a marriage relationship with our God. Family, communion is what God wants for us. And these three signs I told you are, of course, fulfilled in the kingdom of Christ, in the church, which is not just a kingdom, but a universal, and not just universal being in every nation, but it, it's through time and space. Through time and space, the church is katholikos, meaning it is everywhere, it is for everyone, it is universal, and it is tendered, tended or geared towards unity in that communion. So the Queen Mother, of course, is seen in Our Blessed Lady, which is why you see her in Revelation chapter 12 with a crown of, of, of stars on her head. She's got a crown of stars. Who has crowns? Queens do. And, of course, she's bearing a son who is the king to rule all the nations with a scepter. And so if he is the king, then in that kingdom, which he came to restore, as the angel Gabriel suggested, because Gabriel said, Jesus, who is the son will sit on the throne of his father David and his kingdom will have no end. So Jesus came to restore the kingdom of David according to the promise of the father who told David, your kingdom will always be. But then David died and his sons died and it looked as if it was over. But God is never late. No, he's never late and he never lies. And so the promise of God was fulfilled in his church and that is why in this new Davidic kingdom, which is now heavenly, um, we have not just a total sacrifice with bread and wine, but we have bread and wine that is transformed into the body and blood of Christ. And not only do we have a regular minister, but we have a pro Jesus who had the 12 ministers, the apostles, picked one of them, Peter, to be the prime minister, and he's the one who got the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Not any kingdom. It's funny, people debate about whether Peter is the rock, that is in Matthew 16, 18. Well, Peter's not the rock. His faith is the rock. But why are people debating that when they 
missed the whole point when Jesus gave him the keys to the kingdom. That is a much bigger deal. Are you kidding me? You, Peter, dude, you are so irrational sometimes. You say the worst things at the worst times. And you're giving this guy the keys to the kingdom, Jesus? Are you, hello? <laughs> Did you put him through the interview process? <laughs> Human resources? Vouch for him? This guy can't lead the church. He's got the keys to the kingdom, but not any kingdom of heaven. Look it up. It's in the text. The kingdom of heaven. How does he have such authority? Because Christ is with him. Because Christ is the inheritance. And Christ wants to make sure that the inheritance is passed down to all generations. Which is why in Acts 2, verses 38 and 39, when the crowd wants to know what to do to receive salvation, Peter tells them to repent and be baptized. Believe in the gospel. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and your children's children. The promise that we have inherited in Christ Jesus is not just for you, but it is for those who will believe because of you. So to Jesus prayed for the consecration of not only himself, which he already consecrated himself to the Father, but he prayed for the consecration of the disciples that heard him, and for all those, he said, not only for them, but all those that will believe because of their testimony. So that's for you, and now Jesus is praying for those who will believe because of your testimony. So here's a little summary for your salvation history. That what God has been doing, where he is today, he's got a family. And guess what? Just like the people of Israel were able to keep turning away from God and running away from him, so too you can too. Unless you choose to walk in that glorious inheritance. It is a choice of yours, but it's a choice where if you say yes, you will be the happiest person in the world, persecuted, but happy. I love that passage in Mark, St. Mark. It says, you know, whoever gives up mother, father, brother, sister, land, for me, will receive those a hundredfold. Mother, father, brother, sister, land, persecution, and eternal life. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. How'd you sneak persecution in there? <laughs> That's a reward? Yes, it is a reward. According to Jesus, you will be rewarded with persecution. So now, brothers and sisters, this family that God has established, which is, oh, by the way, Isaiah 22 said he would be called a father to all nations. That's what the word pope means, by the way. Pope means father, which is why in Latin it's papa, Spanish, papa, Italian, papa. <laughs> French, pap. Creole, pap. All meaning the same thing. Also, I would call him holy father, by the way. And people get all up in arms. Why do you call him holy, Father? Ain't nobody holy. Only God is holy. Oh, well, really? Well, that's interesting. Because I'm pretty sure God died to make us holy. First Peter chapter something verse something says, <laughs> Because the one <laughs> Because the one who calls you is holy, so too you must be holy. We are holy because God is holy. God is not jealous of our holiness. Some people make it a big deal as if if you call somebody holy, then you're taking away from the glory of Christ. No, you silly. When you are holy, you glorify Christ. And when you recognize the holiness of somebody, you glorify Jesus himself. You're saying it worked. His death and the resurrection worked. Because if we have no saints, then Jesus, his death and resurrection is of no use. We must have saints. Death must be conquered. We must have a communion of saints. We must be able to communicate with those in heaven. We must be one. Otherwise, death is stronger than the death of Christ. Otherwise, the forces of darkness are stronger than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But that can't be because the tomb is empty and Jesus did rise. And so we rise with him. So... Jesus spent three years with his disciples, the apostles, forming them in community, teaching them how to be one, how to be in communion. And by the way, part of the teachings of Jesus must have been about human formation. 
By the way, we need that so badly. And if we have brother priests here, I'm sure they'll agree with me completely. How the human formation is really the foundation of all the other pillars that we talked about. There are the four pillars, the spiritual formation, uh, intellectual formation, uh, uh, pastoral formation, human formation. Look, if there is no human, none of the others will stand. If you're not a real human, I don't care how spiritual you are. It'll hurt badly. You'll make it, but it'll be hurt so bad. You need the human formation. You need to take care of the humanity that is in you. Remember, grace came not to destroy the nature that you have, but it, it comes to repair the nature. It comes to perfect your human nature, and it comes to elevate your human nature. Repair, perfect, and elevate so that your humanity, you become the perfect person that you ought to be, but now you taste of the divinity of God himself because of Christ. And now that your humanity has been elevated, grace builds upon nature. So your humanity must be healthy. Take care of yourself, okay? Yes, that means sleep, see a counselor, and do all these things that are important. That's not what my talk is about, but I'm sure this is for somebody here tonight. Somebody needs to hear this right now. You need to take care of yourself because your humanity is beautiful and it needs to be glorified. The disciples and Mary... They were in communion waiting for the Holy Spirit to come, like we are waiting together in the upper room, right? This retreat is amazing. It falls in this weekend where we are waiting for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So what I'm trying to show you is how the communion that we have, that we need, we need that communion in order to go into that mission. Communion leads to mission. In John 13, <clears throat> verse 34 to 35, that's one of the places where we see how true community evangelizes by life and words. There's probably a phrase you must have heard a thousand times in your life. It's okay to strike it away from your vocabulary, uh, from, your, from your repertoire of phrases. It says, evangelize, preach the, the gospel at all times, use words when necessary. It's cute, isn't it? It's cute. It's cute. But it's misleading on, on a couple different uh, uh, fronts. It's misleading because it, we're told that, who, who said that? Exactly. He didn't. Okay. There's no evidence that Francis ever said that. I'm sorry to bust your bubble, but there's no evidence Francis ever said that. And second, again, it's cute. It, it does um, express some truth, which is that our lives ought to evangelize, ought to preach with our, and our words. But it's misleading in that some people might think, well, I guess I could just not say anything and I'm good. No. Read the book of Acts again. And find out, underline how many times, do this exercise, how many times do you see the word proclaim? Okay? Underline every time you see proclaim and acts, just acts alone. And tell me what you think about, preach the gospel a lot of times, use words when necessary. Words are almost always necessary. Almost always. So we shouldn't take that as an excuse to not proclaim Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, in John 13, a new commandment, Jesus says, I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So loving for one another in communion is how the world will know that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. That's what a disciple is, is the one who loves his brother. In John 17, four chapters later, Verses 20 to 23, I do not pray for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may also be one, even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. How will the world believe? If we are one in communion. The glory which thou hast given me, I have given to them. So Jesus shares his inheritance with us. That they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, and they, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, even as thou hast loved me. That communion, that union in communion is not just optional. And that is why, I guarantee you, if you are in a parish, for example, where there is no unity, you will probably find that your evangelization, excuse my language, sucks. <laughs> probably doesn't happen. 
you're probably not getting no followers of Jesus Christ coming to your parish. Why? You're not one, and you're not loving one another. Jesus is present in the liturgy in many different ways. He's present in the priest, he's present in the word, he's present in the Eucharist, he's present in the assembly. But all these presences of Jesus presuppose faith from people. You need to have faith in order to see Jesus present there. However, there is a presence of Jesus that gives faith, that doesn't presuppose it. And that is Jesus in the community. When there is community that is loving, it is proof that there is something bigger than those people there. Because it's really hard for humans to live with each other. It's really difficult for a group of people to be in love with one another and to serve one another in unity for a long period of time. So when you do it, when you succeed at it with the power of Christ, the world knows. Then the world comes to believe. They will say, see how they love one another. That is the communion that is the basis for true mission. And in Acts 2, so those who received his word were baptized and they were added that day, there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Okay, there's a forming of the first Christian community there and the four pillars of community. So I say communion has four pillars, which leads to mission, which has two pillars. In communion, we have those four pillars laid out in Acts 2, 41 to 42. Specifically, verse 42, which is the apostles' teaching, so the word, fellowship, the breaking of bread, which is the Eucharist, and the prayers. These are the four pillars if you want to be a thriving community. If you do these four things well in your community, then you will be good. And that will necessarily lead to your mission, your evangelizing. And in Acts 4, one last passage. Uh, in Acts 4, <clears throat> now the com uh, verses 32 and 35. Now the company of those who believed were of one heart and soul. So that describes how they were living in those four pillars. Of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. And laid it at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made to each as any had need. Now you're probably hearing this and thinking, wow, that was nice. That would never be possible today. But is the same spirit that was there then, is it not present today? I believe, I truly do believe, any community that would dare do this, that would dare do this, would transform the world. So you wonder, how did the early Christians do it? How did they grow so fast? when there was such persecution and oppression and resistance because of this. You can't resist love like that. You, can't, you simply cannot resist it. When we are detached from material things and attached to Christ and one another, we can do wonders because then we're afraid of nothing. We're afraid of losing nothing because there's nothing to lose. You're not even afraid of losing your life because you know to die is, to, is a gain in Christ. Death is a gain for you. Your suffering, your suffering, you see, you can't go to the temple in Jerusalem because we don't have that temple. We have the temple of Christ. Your suffering becomes a possibility for you to offer a sacrifice unto the Lord. Your suffering, your pain becomes become redemptive gifts. When you are living this reality, I would challenge, I dare any group of people to live like this, to sell everything they have, and to put it together and say nothing is his own. By the way, this is very different from communism. Well, you know what the difference is? Exactly. <laughs> communism is a forced thing. So communism sees the beauty in this. And they try to get this, but with the wrong means. Only the Holy Spirit can bring this about. Only the Holy Spirit. It's the same thing as Babel. The difference between Babel and Pentecost is that Babel, they were trying to do it alone and for themselves. Pentecost, it's the Holy Spirit doing it with them and for the sake of God, for the glory of God. When Jesus is involved, when the Holy Spirit is involved, then it becomes heavenly. 
Otherwise, it's become, it becomes hellish. Now, we see Mary as our first missionary. The gospel is announced to her at the Annunciation. Went to the Holy Land twice, and both times I was able to, to visit Nazareth and the exact grotto where the Blessed Mother was praying and when the angel Gabriel came to speak to her to announce to her the gospel. She received the gospel. She was announced the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going again in February um, of uh, next year. My bishop and I, he's so fun. We're, we're leading a, a group of people to the Holy Land. You, you can find out more information on our website. Um, ask me for my website later. It's because if you ask me, I have to answer the question. But I probably shouldn't say it myself. So just ask me later, okay? Make sure that's one of the questions. <laughs> After Mary receives the gospel, what does she do? She runs in haste. By the way, Nazareth to, Jerus to Judea is very, very far. She ran there to go to her relative, Elizabeth. And here's the beauty of it. We read Luke chapter 1 or 2, the beginning of Luke. That interaction between Elizabeth and Mary is so powerful. The visitation. Her voice alone gives the Holy Spirit. Her greeting makes people dance in the power of the Holy Spirit, reminiscent of the King David himself dancing in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant because she is, of course, the Ark of the New Covenant. So the baby dances at the greeting, at the sound of her voice, Elizabeth said. She was filled with the Holy Spirit because Mary was filled with the Holy Spirit and was carrying the inheritance to share the good news with others. Now, <clears throat> We, in case this is not yet clear, all over scripture, the New Testament, we are told of that duty that we have. And so I'm just going to shoot them out to you real quick. Some passages that uh, make you feel bad if you don't evangelize. Give you, <laughs> give you a guilt trip. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go therefore and make what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What is a disciple? Not just make a believer. Make a disciple, a follower of Jesus. That takes time. That takes investment. How many of you went to the discipleship quad uh, workshop? Raise your hand. The discipleship quads. Only a few of you? Oh, my goodness. Okay. Well, then, something will be repeated. For the rest of you, bad. So <laughs> I, have to, I have to bring you up to date. Okay? I have to bring you up to date. A disciple is a follower, and it takes investment of time, and energy into that person like Jesus did for his own disciples. Um, <clears throat> he says to make disciples of all nations. It's been 2,000 years, people. Half, more, over half of the world still not disciples. What the heck are we doing? It is incumbent upon our generation to fulfill the Great Commission. We can't wait anymore. We can't leave it to the next people to do it. We can't leave it to the professionals, the priests and the bishops and the nuns. Every single one of you is called. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. St. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 9.16, For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. I am cursed if I don't preach the gospel. So are you. Preaching the gospel is a necessity, St. Paul says. And in Acts 1.8, Jesus tells us how far we should go in preaching the gospel. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Pentecost, tomorrow. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So Jerusalem was the center, and then further out to Judea, and then to Samaria, and then to the end of the world. As we saw in the first reading today, St. Paul went to the end of the earth, to Rome, to be able to proclaim the gospel to everybody, even to the Jews while he was in prison. 
power. You'll receive that power. You know, the Bible is so clear, but unfortunately, the, our popes are just not that clear. <clears throat> or are they? In Mission of the Redeemer, St. John Paul II, whom I love so dearly, so, so should you. He says in number one of Redem Redemptoris Missio, or Mission of the Redeemer, you can find it for free online on the Vatican website, Mission of the Redeemer, John Paul II. The mission of Christ the Redeemer, which is entrusted to the church, is still very far from completion. As the second millennium after Christ's coming draws to an end, an overall view of the human race shows that this mission is still only beginning and that we must commit ourselves wholeheartedly to its service. It is the Spirit who impels us to proclaim the great works of God. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. He quotes St. Paul. John Paul II says, we're just beginning, my friends. We have just begun the work. That was back in 2000, a little before 2000. And now we're in 2019 and we're still just beginning. He says, in the name of the whole church, I sense an urgent duty to repeat this cry of St. Paul. From the beginning of my pontificate, I have chosen to travel to the ends of the earth in order to show this missionary concern. My direct contact with peoples who do not know Christ has convinced me even more of the urgency of missionary activity, a subject to which I am devoting the present encyclical. But what moves me even more strongly to proclaim the urgency of missionary evangelization is the fact that it is the primary service which the church can render to every individual and to all humanity in the modern world, a world which has experienced marvelous achievements but which seems to have lost its sense of ultimate realities and of existence itself. Christ the Redeemer fully reveals man to himself. The person who wishes to understand himself thoroughly must draw near to Christ. The primary service that the church can render the world, my dear brothers and sisters, is missionary evangelization. So as church, our primary service is not CRS or food for the poor, as great as those are. I benefit from food for the poor. Uh, it is not the building of homes, as great as those are. People need those. If anybody wants to build some homes in my village, you're welcome to contact me. But it is not the primary service that the church can do, as important as they are. Primary service is missionary evangelization because that will save souls for eternity. The number of those who do not know Christ and do not belong to the church is constantly on the increase. Indeed, since the end of the council, it has almost doubled. When we consider this immense portion of humanity which is loved by the Father and for whom he sent his Son, the urgency of the church's mission is obvious. And by the way, interreligious dialogue doesn't eliminate that urgency because the Holy Father reiterates the fact that there's salvation in one name and one name only, Jesus Christ. People might be saved without belief in Jesus if they are invincibly ignorant of Jesus. But they are not saved because of the ignorance. They're saved because of Christ, of whom they are ignorant. However, the most certain way that we know is to proclaim Christ to them so that they will know. Yes, that is very Catholic, what I'm telling you. I get, I, trust me, I have my Catholic card in my pocket. I could show it to you later. <laughs> and Pope Paul VI was just as clear. He said, those who have received the good news and who have been gathered by it into the community of salvation can and must communicate and spread it. So if you come into communion with Christ, with one another, you can and you must share that inheritance. You must evangelize. That is in Evangelii Nutsiandi 13. In 14, um, he says... We wish to confirm once more that the task of evangelizing all people constitutes the essential mission of the church. The essential mission of the church is the task of evangelizing all people. He goes on to say, 
It is a task and mission which the vast and profound with which the vast and profound changes of present day society make all the more urgent. Evangelizing is in fact the grace and vocation proper to the church, her deepest identity. She exists in order to evangelize. Not my words, the Pope's words. She exists in order to evangelize. That is to say, in order to preach and teach. To be the channel of the gift of grace. To reconcile sinners with God. And to perpetuate Christ's sacrifice in the Mass. Which is the memorial of his death and glorious resurrection. And one final passage from our current Holy Father. In Joy of the Gospel, number 120, my favorite paragraph in that whole document. So listen up. I'll read the whole paragraph to you. In virtue of their baptism, all the members of the people of God, how many? Thank you. Have become missionary disciples. I love that phrase. All of you. How many people baptized here? Raise your hands, please. Any any baptized person here? Oh, look at that. (laughs) Every single one of you by virtue of your baptism, is a missionary disciple. All the baptized, whatever their position in the church or their level of instruction in the faith, are agents of evangelization. And it would be insufficient to envisage a plan of evangelization to be carried out by professionals while the rest of the faithful would simply be passive recipients. The new evangelization calls for personal involvement on the part of each of the baptized. Every Christian is challenged here and now, not tomorrow, not there, but here and now, to be actively engaged in evangelization. Indeed, anyone who has truly experienced God's saving love does not need much time or lengthy training to go out and proclaim that love. Every Christian is a missionary to the extent that he or she has encountered the love of God in Christ Jesus. We no longer say that we are disciples and missionaries, but rather that we are always missionary disciples. If that doesn't put some fire under your bum, I don't know what will. <laughs> let, the fire, let the fire burn. Let it burn for every single one of you. And now some of you, of course, rightly will say, well, how the heck do I evangelize, Father? I would like to, but I'm timid. I'm Catholic. I don't do the whole door-to-door thing. I don't go out on the street with a bullhorn and saying, you're going to hell if you don't repent. How do I do it, Father? Well, there are many good ways to do it. First of all, remember, get yourself in communal life. Parish is probably your most local community, your parish life. If you don't like it, well, then do something about it. Offer yourself to create certain small groups, of course, which can never be a parallel church, which must always bring to feed into the parish and feed from the parish life around the Eucharist. Make sure you're living out the four pillars of communion of the word, the Eucharist, fellowship, and the prayers. So as a group, as a small group, whatever group you're part of, you got to have some kind of small group. You can't just go to Mass on Sunday for one hour or, I'm sorry, 50 minutes, rush back home and call yourself as part of a local community. That is just silly. That's not community. There was a sect in Boston that challenged me with that. They lived together, several families, together in one house. They worked together. They had a business together. They taught the same thing. They really were of one heart and mind. Unfortunately, they were wrong because they had stupid doctrines. But they at least understood the idea of community. And I tell them, well, we have community too. Like, oh, right. When people go to mass and they go home, they don't know their brother's name. They don't know who's sitting next to them. They don't know what you're going through sitting there. They will not notice if you don't come to mass. They don't care if you don't come to mass. No one will notice. Is that community? Is that really what will tell the world? Wow, look how they love one another. I don't think so. Well, do something about it. You find a way to love. You find a way to serve. But don't do it alone. Make sure you do it together. And that's the key of it. So get yourself together. I don't know if you have to start some kind of new movement, new group, but get in communion, get in community around the Eucharist, the word, fellowship, and the prayers. Fellowship is important, having fun with one another. In my community, in my my rectory, I ask Bishop permission to have a little lay community with me at the rectory. We pray together, we eat together, and every Sunday night we have community night. We get cold beers, cold Coke, and other stuff. And we drink and eat supper and we sing. We, we, we love one another. 
and we share our cross and joys over the week. Each person has to go around, my cross was, my joy was. And then we hear that, we pray for one another, and we play a couple games, and we go to bed. It's amazing. You have no idea the grace that we receive from that every single week. And I'm so blessed by it because I'm a priest. Um, I'm married to the church, so when I have a little portion of the church that is with me for me to love like that, it blesses me greatly. So get yourself in community. And that is... Uh, the discipleship quads is one of the ways to do that. I highly, 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 highly recommend it. You can look it up on the Steubenville website. If you look up Steubenville Discipleship Quads, Steubenville Discipleship Quads, just look that up on Google and it'll bring everything up. The basic idea is this, is that you get yourself together with three other people, okay? And Steubenville is actually providing free content. There is a content. The idea is that together you learn to be disciples of Jesus Christ in community. You meet once a week for about a year, around-ish, right? Once a week, that's it. Four people, that's so easy. Pick one place to meet together over coffee or whatever. And it's not just, you're not just teaching a Bible study. It's not what it is. It's discipleship and fellowship. You are learning together from the Lord in his scriptures, in the catechism. You're learning, you're eating together together. And you're leading one another. And the nice thing is, you will start out as the facilitator, but then about three months into it, you pass on the leadership guide to the next person in the group. So they lead for three months, so they get a taste of it. And then they pass it on to the next person. By the end of the year, each one in the group has already led the small group. And each one needs to commit when the year ends to go start a new group. So now you have four people now going to start four different quads. And so that multiplies. In order for you to know what that looks like, it's the idea called spiritual multiplication. And Walter Henriksen in Disciples Are Made Not Born suggests a hypothetical situation that clearly illustrates the process of multiplication. Suppose a father offers his two sons the choice of taking either $1 a week for 52 weeks or one cent the first week and an amount each week for the next 51, uh, 51, one weeks, 51 weeks, that is double the previous week's amount. Which one would you choose? So $1 every week or one cent the first week, which doubles itself every week? The one cent. Do you know why you would choose that? Hmm? Yeah. Okay. So the first choice, at the end of the year, you'd have how much money? $52. The second choice it's called exponential growth. <clears throat> and you would get on the 52nd week, not all the weeks put together, but only on the 52nd week alone, you would have uh, 22,517,998,100,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,
But at the end of 25 years, if you multiply, you only get how many? What's 365,000? A lot. That's 9,125,000. So if you get 1,000 people every day, after 25 years, you get 9 million people. 1,000 every day. You see how much you have to work? 1,000 every day. You get 9 million people after 25 years. But you make one disciple a year who reproduces himself, who understands the fact that I can't sit on my butt and not proclaim and share the inheritance. I must share what I have received. In 25 years, you will end up with 33.5 million. Yeah. That's about four times as much as 1,000 every day. But it takes patience. It takes long vision. It takes knowledge, what you have received today. But if you use the quads, okay, if you use the quads, the, the discipleship quads, um, <clears throat> one year, you know, at, at, in the beginning of the one year, there's just you. And at the end, there's four people. There's four new disciples. Uh, in 10 years, in 10 years, with the quads, there's 262,144 disciples. That's the quads. See, the one disciple it took 25 years to get 33 million. But with the quads, though, provided, of course, that it's, I mean, it's ideal, of course, but we need to go for the ideal. In 25 years with the quads, or in 20 years, <laughs> in 20 years, if the quads are done well, 274 billion. 877,906,944 new disciples. Not just believers, disciples. Oh, just so you know, we don't have that many people on earth. <laughs> so, is it possible to evangelize the whole world? Yes. yes. Jesus was not lying when he told us, go to the whole world and make disciples of all nations. So, Pope Francis said, once you've encountered the love of God, you can't help but to share it with others. You don't need that much lengthy training. Just get yourself in community and go. So share the glorious inheritance because it'll save our church. Amen. <laughs>